Chuck is joining us live today from Bandon, Oregon. He is my brother and he is um, my, my go-to person for all things history. So I really appreciate you coming on today, Chuck, and doing this for us. Um, and this is a, this is interesting. I had, I really, I'd never heard of her before. So I'm sure I've heard her mentioned in passing, but really never, um, didn't really know anything about her. So I don't know. I always, when I think about presidents and women, I, I just think of, uh, Mondale's running mate and that's it. I don't go further back than that. <laughs> so anyway, this is, um, a real a real treat for us this is uh, the last week of women's history month so this is our women's history month focus and uh we're ready to go so take it away thanks michelle uh once again it's my pleasure to be here and uh it's extremely exciting to uh bring this presentation to you today uh as michelle mentioned we're going to be learning about uh the life and times of belva lockwood uh, a really remarkable person who history has uh, mostly sadly forgotten. Uh, we're going to try to boost her back up to her due place in history. Uh, she was a true pioneer when it came to uh, equal rights, uh, a suffrage a battler uh, her whole life, uh, mostly for, uh, for the right for women to vote and just for equal pay, for an equal chance to, 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 to earn a living. Everything she fought for was about equal rights. And, um, and I think we'll learn, uh, she did a very wonderful job in, in, in uh, setting out to do so. So we begin the story of Belva in uh, upstate New York. Um, she was uh, born Belva Bennett uh, to a farm family in upstate New York near the town of Royalton. She was born in 1830. Uh, with uh, several siblings. I believe she had four sisters and a brother and grew up participating in the farm chores and such, but uh, early on realized uh, the inequality between the sexes, the way her parents treated her as opposed to her brother and um, started early on to formulate her views of, uh, of personhood equality and it stuck with her throughout her life. She was an excellent student she was encouraged to learn by her parents to a point. Uh, she was uh, able to um, uh, to uh, keep up with her, her studies and, and the farm chores and eventually showed the initiative to, uh, to be sent off to uh, Genesee Wesleyan Seminary School in the town of Lima, New York, not, not too far from her birthplace here in Royalton. And, uh, and there you see a, a, a depiction of the school. This was actually a, one of the uh, schools that got absorbed into what became Syracuse University. So when she was studying here, they had a separated uh, system for, for boys and girls. And she dared to take some of the classes that were mostly uh, offered to just the boys. So she became the lone uh, girl in some of these classes and excelled at her studies and uh, achieved her diploma and went on to pretty much the only career that uh, a woman uh, in this day and age could, could uh, aspire to, and that was uh, the profession of teaching. So you see uh, the typical path, this was probably, we're talking about the mid to late 1840s where she, she began this, this uh, quest on a teaching career. And it was right around this time uh, 1848 it was that we we have two of the giants in the women's suffrage movement, uh, Susan B. Anthony, uh, a legendary reformer and activist, along with her friend um, Elizabeth Cody Stanton. Uh, they end up they end up being the um, I'm sorry Elizabeth Cady Stanton. They end up being the uh, the stalwarts at the uh, Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, which is the first public statement put out by women with some of some male supporters as well, basically stated it was a basic uh, uh, manifesto of, uh, of women's rights um, at a very early time in history. So 
There is no record of Belva being aware of these 1848 activities near her spot there in upstate New York, but it's almost sure she was aware of this because this was widely covered in newspapers. And um, for someone like Belva, who was well-read and, and very interested in current events and politics, uh, there's certainly no doubt she was aware of the events in, in the uh, late 1840s near her neck of the woods. And these conventions continued annually. So again, she became more interested in the women's rights movement. Uh, and she was in a natural place to be doing this in upstate New York, where uh, it seemed that the, the expression of inquiry and, and, uh, and women's education and, uh, and, and African-American rights all seemed to have a place in this, in this part of the country. Um, not, you really couldn't say this about everywhere, especially rural America at this time, but there was a sense of, um, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to call it, um, innovation or growth, but I, I think it's a sense of tolerance in this area that shows up, um, in the Mormon story. This is uh, not long after the formation of the Mormon church in the 1830s in this area of New York. So again, there seems to be a, a general feeling of tolerance that uh, that is surrounding Belva as she's growing up. Limited tolerance, to be sure. So we move along to, uh, to the uh, Owego Female Seminary, and this is a building that Belva purchased in 1863. Now, this is after Belva had worked for, oh, a, probably a good solid decade as a teacher in the Royalton area and Lockport, New York area. And this is also where she uh, meets up with some of these leaders um, in the movement like Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony was also an educator at this time. And so Susan and Belva started to correspond at the teachers conventions of the, of the era and found that they both had an interest in, um, in furthering women's uh, rights. So as a result, Belva saves her money teaching. And um, uh, this is also uh, at a time when she was, uh, this is right around the time when she, when she went to the, um, the, uh, the seminary. Uh, she, she graduated from the seminary and married a local farm, farm, uh, farm boy. His name was Uriah McNall. Uh, they did have a child together, and he died very soon after that, when the when the child was 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 a mere toddler. So uh, Belva was widowed at a very young age. She got married around the age of eighteen and was widowed by her early twenties. So this gave her the freedom, in a sense, that others did not have. She ended up leaving her baby uh, with her parents and continued on her education at the uh, Genesee. Uh, seminary. So this was done with a small ch child back at the house, and she continued on uh, by leaving her her child with relatives again and purchasing this building in Owego, New York, in 1863. This is in in southern upstate New York, so near the Pennsylvania border, and she runs a very successful business for a very short time, uh, only a two year period, but ends up selling the school, which was a boarding house as well and doubling her money on the transaction. And then she uh, decides it's time for a change. And in 1866, she decides to move to Washington, DC. She's also um, seeing perhaps the end of her teaching career. She's getting a bit restless with teaching at this point, And she's uh, really interested in, in reading about and studying the law. And she's, she's feeling a little bit uh, drawn towards uh, the law profession already at this time. Um, so we see her in uh, right after the Civil War, 1866, we see Belva packing up uh, to head to DC with her small savings from the sale of her property and her business. And she ends up in DC, 1866. And we see an image I believe coming up of the Capitol Actually, we, we meet her daughter first, uh, Laura. This is the daughter, her first daughter, who I mentioned was uh, lost her dad at a very young age and was mostly raised by uh, one of Belva's sisters and Belva's parents. And this takes place until Laura graduates from the Genesee Wesleyan Seminary, uh, the same school that her mom graduated from. Uh, Laura is sent there 
also uh, shows a great proclivity towards studying and education, graduates with honors, and eventually joins her mother in Washington, D.C., not long after Belva's relocation. Laura graduates, relocates to D.C., and the two of them, mother and daughter, start a, uh, a boarding school. They do the same thing, basically, they, that uh, Belva had done in Owego. Uh, they don't purchase the building this time. They rent it simply, and they run a, a boarding school where Laura is the main instructor and Belva is kind of the overseer. Uh, a very, uh, again, a very successful enterprise, but not extremely lucrative. Uh, we see, we see um, the rise at this point also of uh, the woman on our screen now, Victoria Woodhull. This is the, uh, the late 1860s now. Uh, Victoria Woodhull was uh, gained first notoriety by being a spiritualist. She was traveling with her sister, uh, giving seminars and lectures on spiritualism. She was, uh, she had worked for uh, several wealthy people, including Cornelius Vanderbilt, who became a supporter of hers. She started the first female owned Wall Street brokerage firm in the late 1860s, also with her sister. And in 1870 declares her candidacy for the presidency of the United States. Um, this was done um, as much as a uh, publicity stunt as it was a sincere uh, attempt to become president. She was not eligible to run for president uh, simply because she wasn't old enough at the time. But she was a brilliant strategist and a very, very uh, cagey um, uh, person to, uh, to be at the forefront of the suffrage movement in these early stages. And she's she becomes one of the first women to lobby before Congress uh, about uh, women's suffrage uh, matters. And um, again, uh, someone like Belva, who certainly was aware of Victoria, went to see her speak on several occasions. Uh, Belva was very intrigued uh, by by Victoria's stance, and yet was a very different type of person. Um, but I think the one thing that Belva picked up from Victoria, and again, I'm using Victoria as the prototype example of um, of a woman presidential candidate of this period. Uh, the one thing Belva did, I think, either learn from Victoria or had already in her that Victoria had was a sense of publicity, uh, different styles and different methods, but they were both very good at using logic, uh, tugging at heartstrings. They had, they had um, very personal stories to tell that, um, again, weren't as much about themselves as about trying to set examples, trying to bring attention, trying to bring awareness to the story of uh, these struggles that women were facing. And we, we don't realize today um, some of the struggles. The, the suffrage story is a pretty obvious one. Uh, so many other stories are involved, including in, in Belva's case, probably the most important one was, was equal pay. Belva realized as a teacher right away that she was being paid half as much as the male teachers for doing as much or more work. And so Belva's equal rights uh, bent really starts on an equal pay uh, platform. And Victoria Woodhull is uh, absolutely uh, uh, supportive of these of these. Uh, attention getting type methods to uh, to just throw some light on the situation uh, for for people who might be increasingly enlightened um, in the post Civil War era. A lot of the activists before the Civil War had been uh, uh, trying to, of course, uh, achieve um, emancipation for the uh, slaves and post Civil War. We see splits in these activist groups. Um, some are sticking with the freedmen and, and trying to get the 14th and 15th Amendments passed so they have citizens' rights and voting rights. And others see, uh, see that movement as taking away, as being taking away energy from the women's movement at the same time. So you see, you start to see splits in these um, activist groups right after the Civil War, and they get more severe as the decades proceed after the Civil War. But we do have an example here in Victoria of uh, someone bucking the system and getting plenty of attention. 
Uh, unfortunately, she spent the 1872 election in jail. Uh, as I mentioned, she was not eligible uh, due to her age. Um, her sex had no role in that, but she was jailed uh, for a mailing obscene material, uh, 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 violating a law that had just been passed, possibly put out to go after her. So that's where she spent her, her, um, her 1872 election. So we continue on with other friends of uh, Belva. These are people she met or knew of when she first got to Washington, D.C. Uh, here we see Dr. Mary Walker, who deserves an hour of her own. Um, a absolutely remarkable person from this era. Uh, befriends Belva almost immediately upon uh, entering uh, D.C. They're both, both active in the women's uh, suffrage movement. Um, but Mary's story goes back to prior to the Civil War. Uh, she was a trained physician and surgeon, uh, tried to get into the military during the war, was denied admission. So she volunteered as a surgeon, ended up getting a contract to work for the government during the war and uh, received the Medal of Honor for her valor uh, during uh, some campaigns later later in the war. She was actually captured, uh, held prisoner for four months in a Confederate prison and uh, was exchanged for an officer later and then given the Medal of Honor. Um, all the while, uh, while showing, as you can see in this picture, a, a strong propensity for uh, non-female traditional clothing. Um, she grew up on a farm. She grew up with very, very open-minded parents who encouraged her to dress comfortably. And um, as a result, as her fame kind of grew post-Civil War, she became one of Washington's most notorious oddball figures in the sense that uh, she was arrested dozens of times for being dressed in, uh, as a man. Uh, she refuted the claims, uh, always saying that I am not wearing men's clothing, I am wearing my own clothing. And she got increasingly uh, adamant about her, her attire, including wearing top hats, uh, which just drove most men up a wall, to be honest with you, and some women as well. But uh, again, this was a brilliant person who... I couldn't be more different than Belva in many ways, um, much more liberal in many ways than Belva, uh, as we'll see with some of her other colleagues. But again, a, a brilliant strategist and an indomitable uh, character that Belva counted on and actually uh, uh, rented a room from Belva uh, pretty much for a 40 year period from Belva's entry to DC until her death. So we're also going to meet uh, another important woman at this time in the movement. Her name is Myra Bradwell, uh, born in Vermont, uh, moved to Illinois at a very young age, uh, married uh, a lawyer and studied the law under him to the point where she became as proficient as him and was approved uh, to be passed by the Illinois bar by a circuit judge, a federal circuit judge, and then was denied by the state of Ohio, or I'm sorry, Illinois. Uh, it was uh, knocked around all the way up to the Supreme Court, and they denied the, uh, involvement in this case at the Supreme Court level, saying it's, it's up to the state. Um, the state can decide whatever they want, whoever uh, passes their bar, uh, you know, it, it's up to them. So they, 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 re, they declined um, intervening. And this is a common tactic of the courts at this time. Uh, many of these women activists were uh, clamoring for a federal protection of women's rights, whether it be voting rights, whether it be equal pay. Uh, they saw that the states were not for the most part, out to protect them. Um, and they were looking for federal protection, particularly after the 14th and 15th Amendments passed. Uh, well, certainly the 14th, um, because a lot of activists were using the, the, the right given to Black men to vote as the right for all citizens to vote. And they were trying to extend that right to to, uh, to women, women's rights. And in the Bradwell case, um, it, was, it was seen as a test case. And of course, failing, 
uh, to be approved uh, by the uh, by the Supreme Court, and of course, having the block put on her by the Illinois courts, she ended up giving up her dream of becoming a lawyer and went back to editing the Chicago Legal News uh, magazine, which was the most widely read. Uh, legal paper in the country for a very long time, for a good three or four decades. So her career was not uh, derailed. It was just sidetracked uh, to something a little bit different. But she she shows up again throughout the 1870s and 80s as an interested participant, uh, someone who always was out to help uh, any f- young females trying to enter the law profession. And she became kind of a a uh, go-to troubleshooter for a lot of these people. So her, she took more of a backseat role, but again, plays a big role early on in, in the perception that Belva is, 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 um, is up against in in DC during the 1870s. And our last uh, friend of Belva's we'll meet at this point is uh, a woman named Matilda Gage. And this is someone who, again, we should know more about this woman, uh, a very dynamic, writer, editor, publisher, activist. Uh, she's right up there with, uh, with uh, Susan B. And, and Elizabeth as far as the leader uh, of the women's suffrage movement. Again, at a very young age in the early 1850s, she was born in 1826. So she was in her late 20s. She becomes uh, at the forefront, she goes to the forefront of the uh, suffrage movement. Um, her her route gets a little more radical than than some of the more traditional older uh, suffragists. She founds her own group, uh, the the Women's National Liberal Union, in 1890, in response to what she thought were uh, takeovers by more conservative women in, in the group. These were the temperance women. Uh, these were the 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 really heavily church influenced women who were kind of guiding the group in a different direction. Uh, Matilda was a champion of, of, of free thinking, and uh, she, she railed at very, very much of the church uh, uh, patriarchal structure. And here's a quote from Matilda Gage from 1883, uh, a, a piece she wrote called Is Woman Her Own? And the quote is, Regarding uh, trial cases uh, where where the, the women victims are uh, basically um, in the middle of the uh, of the of the publicity of these trials, and she says, "quote Many a woman has laughed the silent, derisive laugh at the decision, decisions of eminent medical and legal authorities in cases of crimes committed against her as a woman." Never until she sits as a juror on such trials will or can just decisions be rendered, end quote. And again, she saw so many uh, problems in the system regarding uh, a woman just able to defend herself in, in, a, in, a, in a legal situation. Um, her radicalness uh, never alienates her from Belva Lockwood, though. Again, Belva has friends on the way conservative side and the way liberal side of this and Bella kind of ends up in the middle of it all. She sees value and usefulness on, on, on both sides of her, but again, presents a much less controversial uh, within the realm of controversy that she's, you know, a woman out there in a man's world. Um, She takes a much more conservative approach to her, to her uh, correspondence and her, her, um, expressing herself. And there, there's a really great, great quote by the author I wanted to read now. This is the author uh, of the only biography that I know of, the modern biography of Belva. This is, this is the, uh, the main book here. And I just want to read a quote before we get to the next person. Uh, Jill Nordgren, the author, uh, has it this way. And this is kind of summing up Belva um, and, and what she was about. Quote, And what became the unifying theme of her life in the classroom, courtroom, and lecture hall, in newspaper articles, campaign speeches, and letters to the presidents, she defended the ideas in which she believed, unlike some 19th century women who saved their rebellious thoughts for private diaries, she chose the most public methods to express herself. So again, it's women like Matilda Gage who came before Belva that gave Belva the courage to speak out and speak up and speak frequently and speak often. And to do this, of course, it couldn't just be within a a woman's circle. There had to be some men involved. 
as um, troubleshooters, as interference runners, as the presenters to an all-male world of the women's story. And we meet uh, one of those people coming up here. Uh, this is a key figure in the fight that Belva was going through in the 1870s to become a fully fledged lawyer in Washington, DC. And his name is Albert Riddle. I, I saw him a minute ago. I know he's there. And with Albert Riddle, what's important to remember is he's just an example of a, a lawyer from DC, uh, an advocate of women's rights who actually put his practice on the line to advocate for the, the Belvas of the world. And at least twice, if not a third time, Albert Riddle is asked to go present Belva's case in front of these various courts. Now, how it works in DC at the time, this is an age of varying bar requirements from state to state, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So basically what Belva is being asked to do is to go in front of each level of court that she wishes to argue in front of and pass their bar. There's no like one bar fits all for all of the courts in DC because you have federal district, you know, there's all different levels. And so what Belva has to do is piece by piece, she has to get approval from each of these levels. And uh, a lawyer like Albert Riddle was basically used as a front man to approach the bench with this, this, this stack of paperwork, backing her character, showing her court records from other courts. And literally, you know, you would expect doors would start to open uh, in this format because you have a respected local lawyer. And he wasn't the only one. There were at least a half a dozen, if not more, other local male lawyers. Of course, there weren't any female lawyers. I think one had been approved in, in D.C. before Belva. So again, Belva's acceptance into the field of law is very slow. She starts going to law school. She starts getting interested on her own reading. She's invited to go to certain classes to listen to law, lawyers speak. And so in these, I think there were three or four different law schools, and these were just starting to form in, 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 around the country at this time. She's basically invited, comes in, excels at the work, and then is denied at whether she's denied continuing classes because the males are processing, whether she's denied the diploma after passing all the classes. There, there, if you think that, you know, stories, you know, show a lot of hoops to jump through, th th there's no story with more hoops than this one. Belva trying to get her law license in the 1870s. And again, she does it piecemeal so she can get approved by one bar association and then she can argue in front of that one, but she can't argue in front of the two other ones that might be necessary in, in, in the same case. So clients can't really count on her necessarily without other assistance from lawyers who are approved at these different levels. So it's a nightmare. It's a, it's a patchwork nightmare for a, believe it or not, a 10 year period from 1869 when she first attends night school law classes to 1879 when she's finally approved to argue in front of the US Supreme Court. It is a 10 year nightmare and other women were going through it with her, gave up. Uh, somewhere along the line, women would just say, look, I can't deal with this rejection. I, I'm going to go get married and do something else. I'm going to go become an activist over there. Like they, the women were just dropping out. She was the last woman standing uh, after this long, long period to actually uh, stick it out and get her official license to practice. And still she had in 1879, she was approved by the U.S. Supreme Court. She still wasn't approved in all of the under courts. In fact, she was not approved to to practice law in, in Maryland. And this is 10 years after she's practicing law in DC. And the, the judge in the case in Maryland, and again, because the feds have left it up to the states to decide the requirements, the judge in Maryland who decides against her actually says, I hope God never allows women to become lawyers. Like, like just blatant discrimination. Uh, and, and these are cases that, that women are not barred. You know, as, as Belva often pointed out, women were not barred from running for president. Women were not specifically barred from voting. They were not approved to vote, but they were not barred from it. So a lot of uh, a lot of her cases are based on original right to vote. The 14th Amendment change, which allowed 
the federal governments to to step into states in some cases to, to protect voting rights. I mean, this was the first, you know, that, that that amendment is the first time the feds step in. And so she thinks there's an opening there, as do other women activists, and and it's just one shut door after another. So people like Albert Riddle deserve credit here uh, for their perseverance and persistence. Uh, not that it matched Belva's, but it, it, it had to be pretty high just to get to get her approved uh, in, in the D.C. bar uh, morass. So we continue on and we are going to uh, finally see the bar admission certificate. I know it's a blurry kind of document there, but this is the official allowance by the Supreme Court saying, Belva, you're 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 OK by us. Um, in fact, the, the chief, uh, Morrison Waite, in an 1875 decision, or it might have been 1876, um, quietly, along with two other justices, approved Belva to, to, to argue in front of the Supreme Court. He, he was overruled by a six to three decision. And when asked publicly, didn't say anything about it. So it wasn't known. He had already prior prior uh, approval of Belva. And so by the time 1879 rolled around, they were the justices were led by the chief who already had met and known and liked Belva. In fact, when she's there getting her final admission into the bar, Chief Waite looks at her and smiles and says to the, the presenting lawyer, is there any character issues with her? Like it was kind of an inside joke because he already knew she was, she was good to go. So anyway, we have this this uh, long awaited uh, bar admission. And at the same time, there were other courts she could not argue in front of. So it wasn't a full lawyer position. As a result of the, uh, the decisions here, um, she's limited in her law practice. She, she ends up taking a lot of smaller uh, claim cases, um, pension claim cases with the government. She she lobbies the government as well to to increase funding for these pension claims, of course, helping her own business in the process. And um, she has a fairly successful practice at this point. It's not big and it's also um, not done alone. She, she had uh, remarried earlier in the decade um, a, a, an elderly dentist. She was in her late 30s and he was in his mid to late 60s. His name was Ezekiel Lockwood. They did have a child who did not live um, more than a year and a half. Uh, so um, it's a it's a it's a brief marriage. He ends up dying, um, I think, six or seven years into their marriage, in his mid seventies. Um, we'll, we're almost ready for the bicycle pioneer. But but it, what Ezekiel Lockwood's uh, marriage to Belva. Uh, did is it, it got her into a different circle in D.C. And it was basically um, the small claims uh, uh, court circle. Um, he was involved in helping pensioners uh, receive government claims. She uh, started basically her pre-law career was was helping him with these claims. So she had a great familiarity with the, the processes and the paperwork. And um, when he passed away in the mid 1870s, she was very well poised to uh, build up a a a kind of a uh, limited law practice um, and one of the ways she built up her practice was by utilizing the newfangled contraption known as a bicycle to get around town she was one of the first women to own a bicycle in washington dc uh, this picture is from the early 1880s and she was widely ridiculed and criticized and her response was simply, I get around quicker and I can see more clients. It's actually really good for business. It was strictly a practical thing for her. You know, she wasn't trying to show off. It was just a way to get around, you know, and, and, and again, DC was a big enough city. It really, it really helped her mobility. So she didn't, didn't mind the publicity and absolutely loved the convenience of, of the bicycle. And so we continue on in the 1880s now. Um, Belva has uh, built her practice up. She's well known in DC legal circles. She's a very forceful speaker. She's not a dramatic speaker. She doesn't really, um, she's on the dry side, doesn't use a lot of humor here, but she's got a lot of hubris. She's got a lot of confidence at this point. Uh, so we're into the 1880s now. So there's been, I think at this point, four 
perhaps we're on the fifth president that's been in DC since she got there in, in 1866. She wrote letters to every single president uh, asking for consulships, um, pleading the case of uh, equal pay, uh, asking President Grant to overrule the board of directors at one of the law schools she was at, the National Law School. She really did feel free to express herself and, and did so. Uh, with with no problem. And sometime in the 1884 campaign season, uh, the the women's uh, suffrage uh, groups that were uh, campaigning for Republicans and Democrats, um, again, real, are starting to realize that they're not really going to be included in their platforms. For example, in 1884's uh, Republican convention during the summer, uh, women were asked for the uh, for the uh, right to stand up and speak and were shut down and blocked from speaking at the convention, which angered many of them. And uh, they decided uh, these angry uh, um, branch uh, folks decided to uh, go off on their own. And they began uh, this it's the second formation of what's what was known as the Equal Rights Party. And they nominate uh, people for president and vice president who aren't aware there is a party or that they are the nominees. So when they find out, they refuse. And eventually the nomination comes around to Belva Lockwood. And um, at first it was seen as a prank. In fact, one of the women who nominated her, Clara Fultz, uh, later broke the news to her that, you know, we really did this as kind of a prank. But Belva took it very seriously. And even though she wasn't nominated until late August, early September of 1884, she threw herself full force into this campaign. Uh, one of the things she repeated quite often was that, I can't vote for myself, but I can sure run for president. There's nothing in the constitution that says I can't. And she was right about that. She was right about a lot of things. And here's another quote from Belva uh, around the same time as she's entering the presidential race. Quote, it is quite time that we had our own party, meaning women, our own platform, and our own nominees. We shall never have equal rights until we take them, nor respect until we command it. End quote. Very forceful, very, uh, very exacting, and again, never took this as a lark. This is a woman who not only took the job seriously uh, as presidential candidate, she also uh, organized electors, uh, set up her own campaign tour with virtually no money. Uh, she ended up charging admission for her presidential lectures, and she ended up after the campaign with 150 bucks. So she she claimed she was the only candidate who came out of it with money, which is probably true. And also, she captured the attention of the nation at this point. She was a regional, regionally known person, a minor celebrity, perhaps in, in legal circles in D.C. and the East Coast. And, now she becomes a national figure. Uh, a, a man wrote her a poem, which she had published because she found it so amusing. And the poem went, Oh, Belva Ann, fair Belva Ann, I know that thou art not a man, but I shall vote, pull off my coat, and work for thee, fair Belva Ann. Uh, again, um, she had fun with these, with these uh, little bits of attention. There was another group uh, that a group of men who got together uh, what they called Belva Lockwood clubs. These were semi farcical, mild mockeries, I suppose you can say of Belva, but they weren't done with uh, evil intent. These men would get together uh, at locations where Belva was scheduled to speak wearing Mother Hubbard dresses, which I'm not a real fashion guy, but I'm assuming those are like the frocks, the, the one size frock dress kind of thing. And so these people were, these men were dressing, uh, in, they were dressing up as women and going to these meetings. I'm not sure if that would fly today in some states. I think that would be violating some, uh, some drag rules uh, in some places. But at any rate, in the, in the modern liberal days of 1884, this was considered amusing and comical. Belva thickest skin of anybody. The Belva, you know, it's not that she didn't feel insults and, and, and pain. It's just that she had to develop a thick enough, a thick enough skin to just have it bounce off so she can continue on. I mean, all of the, all of the emotional pain she went through with her kids and her, her losing two husbands, 
there's no real record of, of, of mourning, of, 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 of emotional distress, because she didn't leave a diary for one thing, apparently. And also, she just had this moving on quality about her, which was not uncommon to people of the era when death was so common. You just had to kind of gather it up and move ahead. And she was very good at that. Um, but again, the, the, the build up to the presidency or the, the, the candidacy uh, is, is a fascinating one because again, she had eight states with electors lined up, meaning that they were pledged that you know, she would have a small percentage of electors in these states. These were not the days of one, you win the state, you win all the electors. Electoral votes were broken down in many states, almost all of them. So you, could, you can split tickets in states. And also, uh, we did not have an Australian style ballot as we do today, where you have all of the names on one list. Every party had their own ballot. So she, as the Equal Rights Party candidate, had ballots made up in the states where she knew she had pledged electors. And we'll see one of these coming up. I believe we have, um, well, we do have one of these ballots a, a couple of slides from now. Here we have some of the publicity that was going out towards the uh, towards the the election. Um, what was in, in what was already a very contentious uh, Blaine versus Cleveland election, meaning personal insults were really the, the the name of the day. It wasn't so much substance. These these men were not arguing about policy; they were arguing about personal conduct. Uh, and so Puck decides to throw in Benjamin Butler, who was the prohibition candidate with the, the newly formed Equal Rights Party candidate, Belva. And the, the caption was something about the clown show. So welcome to the clown show or some, some such thing. Belva loved this cartoon. She, she framed it, was proud of it, uh, saw no harm or anything but humor in it. So again, Belva took on the, the critics with a, with a smile. And again, she was also... Uh, as she was campaigning through the West and the Midwest, she was soliciting work for her business. She was getting uh, a small claims business uh, lined up. She had, you know, papers sent back to the DC office. So she was, she was not, she couldn't afford to simply go out and talk for free. She had to charge admission for the speeches and she had to drum up business while she was running for president. So she successfully did both. And we see again, another, um, uh, uh, picture here from uh, her uh, her 1884 uh, uh, companion. This is Marietta Stowe. We'll go back to Marietta for a second here. Um, she's basically the inventor of the Equal Rights Party, and her story begins very very briefly. Uh, she's she marries a very wealthy man uh, decades before this event, who passes away in I believe it was the state of California and. The state of California decides that because women can't inherit uh, clearly at this time, uh, that they're going to put it into probate court and they end up uh, giving her nothing. So so she 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 loses a husband who's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and she receives nothing out of the deal because lawyers and the probate court fees and they just drain all the money away and because she has no rights as a woman to inherit her husband's estate. So she, this is her bent. She becomes absolutely hell bent on property rights for women. It's more, it's more about that for her than the vote. Although she realizes that gaining the vote will give women a chance to vote on their own futures. So that's why she combines in with the, the voting rights people, but really she's about property rights. She hires at one point Belva to look into this case and, they meet up with the usual roadblocks. And so, so Belva, like Marietta, believe that publicity is, is really important. And, and, and Marietta's idea is to uh, start a party, run a female candidate, and not knowing how perfect Belva would be for the role. Uh, she had other VP candidates with her, with Belva. Uh, none of them chose to run. So Marietta steps in herself as the VP candidate in 1884. And again, Outside of her, her, her racism, uh, she's a rabidly anti-Asian uh, uh, activist, um, they, Belva and Marietta do see eye to eye on many issues and they do get along fairly well. So we see that now the, uh, the next slide will have the ballot. Uh, this is the Equal Rights Party ballot from New York State, 1884 election. 
And what we what we find out later after the election is if we can get the slide to go forward here. Um, the, there, there was a um, uh, quite a, a question about the results of the election. Um, as I said earlier, Belva knew she had eight states with electors, meaning that they should have been counted and shown up in the in the tallies. The official tallies show Belva Lockwood getting zero votes in the 1884 election, which was completely not true. And Belva knew this. And she had, in fact, documented 4,700 and some odd votes. But the most important of these contested votes, and she did indeed contest the election. She filed a formal complaint in January of 1885 with, the, with Congress before they had counted the electoral votes. She asked for Congress to throw out the votes of New York, all of them, because she could prove here we see the ballot. She could prove that in New York State, the 1,900 or so votes for her were given to Grover Cleveland. He won New York State by 1,700 votes. So basically, Bell was saying, if, if they don't do that, if they just count my votes for me like they're supposed to, then Blaine wins New York and Blaine is the president. So this is a big contention she's making that basically voter fraud is part of it. There's another part of her complaint where she has documentation that vote, votes were thrown into the garbage can in Pennsylvania, not shifted, just dumped. So she, she claims it's, it's absolutely physically impossible to come out with zero votes when I have eight elector, eight states with electors in them. Also correct. However, it, not surprisingly, Congress throws out her complaint and they certify Grover Cleveland as the president about a month after she filed these uh, complaints. So business as usual, uh, Belva goes goes back to work uh, being a lawyer. Now, she's again, she's not enjoying a, a super lucrative law practice. She's limited to lower level cases. And she, this is the period where she decides to branch out and go into the lecture circuit. This is connected to her lecturing for the presidency. She felt very comfortable with it. She had done it once before in the early 1870s for four months working for a newspaper as a correspondent. So she liked the road. She liked traveling. She liked meeting new people. She liked talking. She liked presenting her opinions. And this was an attempt by a company out of Chicago. I believe she was associated with this company for eight years. So they would send her on these lecture tours. And remember, lecture tours were the entertainment value of the era, you know, without any other source of, of, uh, of, of live, live entertainment outside of just reading your, your, your own papers or magazines. You know, going to an event, listening to debates, listening to lectures was a huge part of social life in the 1870s and, and 80s and 90s. Um, some of the highest paid speakers in the country were lecturers. Uh, at this time time period. Uh, Belva was not one of the highest paid lecturers of this time period. She averaged between, I would say, 30 to 100 bucks per lecture. But more importantly, she used the lecture tours as a way to drum up more business. She was able to bring a lot of these claims cases against the government to her office where she had her faithful daughter, Laura, waiting for these uh, packets in the mail, and she would pros begin the processing and Belva would come back from the tour and finish helping. And that's how they made their steady income was basically from these small cases Belva would drum up during her lecture tours. But again, the lecturing was not a small part of her income. It was a significant part, several thousand per year. And again, she's building up her fame. She's building up her reputation. And here's another uh, personal uh, lecture uh, poster that she printed out. The first one was printed by the company. This one she did herself. And again, she had to change the topics every year because she couldn't go back to the same, you know, you know, um, uh, arena and, and repeat topics. She always had to keep things fresh and she tended to shy away from the controversy. She actually learned as she was speaking that people did not really want to hear about women's rights very much. It wasn't a topic that was going to bring people in. So she limited her discussions on that topic quite often. Um, figuring uh, there were other times to spread that message. And one of those times, again, came up in the next election cycle, 1888, where she, again, is chosen by the Equal Rights Party and, and chooses to run uh, for the presidency against Cleveland and uh, the newcomer, Benjamin Harrison, the Republican candidate. And this time, um, 
the novelty had worn off. Uh, many in the women's movement thought she was doing this for a self-serving kind of reason and not for the greater cause. So this alienated her from uh, many of her, um, her female colleagues. But she, again, her, her idea was any publicity is good publicity. Uh, bringing attention to these problems is very important. And there was another thing that was alienating uh, Belva from her fellow colleagues at this point, and it was her advocacy of the Mormon church. Uh, her advocacy uh, started with an adv advocacy of uh, women's voting rights, of course. And in 1870, the Utah legislature had given women the voting right. And of course, this included women in polygamous relationships. And the, the abhorrence to polygamy was so strong during the 1870s and 80s that um, legislation just kept popping up, uh, going after not just polygamy, but the Mormons themselves. And Belva really saw this as an attack on, on, on religious freedom, certainly an attack on women's rights to vote. And she befriended and perhaps even became a paid lobbyist for the Mormon church. We don't know that for a fact, but there certainly are friendly letters and all sorts of commendations from the church toward her because she was so adamant in her support of their freedoms. And she did not support polygamy. This is the weird thing is that she was accused of that by supporting the Mormons. And she said, no, I don't support that particular thing, but I do support their their right to practice their religion. That just happens to be one of the weird things about their religion. But if you take away voting rights, you're, you're taking away everything. I mean, that's the only way they, these women can vote themselves out of polygamy is if they're allowed to vote. So to her, voting rights for women were, were absolutely primary uh, in, this, in this debate. And she did not care that people like uh, Susan B. Anthony were just dropping from the wayside. They could not support her second campaign. They could not support her supporting Mormons. And she would attack legislation that was going after Mormons. She would attack the senators who were supporting anti-Mormon legislation. So again, this is an odd stance to be taking at this time. She's pretty much alone in, in D.C. with this uh, with this story. And um, her other focus in later in her career becomes the peace movement. And we'll see in the next photos, her posing with the members of the Universal Peace Union. Uh, and again, she started her organization, or she started membership in this organization uh, quite soon after arriving in DC. I wanna say the late 1860s, she was already a member of the peace, the peace organizations. Um, but uh, increasingly as she, as she got older, she saw the need for focusing on arbitration as a means of getting out of world disputes as opposed to war. So she became a really strong and strident anti-war activist through her, her peace work. And again, it, it wasn't impractical. She didn't talk about dismantling standing armies as much as she talked about arbitration. She was obsessed with arbitration to the point where uh, again, back to her letter writing campaigns to the president, she wrote Cleveland multiple times about the need uh, to, to, to at least promote arbitration, focus on it. This, this is a, a wave of the future. She saw, she saw, she saw arbitration uh, as being um, the new way, the new world order for resolving disputes. And uh, it would end all of the bloodshed. And she she really had a higher belief that you know people were going to figure this out and 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 see her way. Um, we see her again. Her activism with the peace the peace groups gets much more uh, intense. She's sent to Europe by these groups to to represent the United States in in some international peace conferences, and she's very very forceful in her in her opinions. Um, and again, this is during mostly a peaceful time period uh, in, our, in our country's history. There is the Spanish-American War blip in 1898, but outside of that, uh, we're not, we're, we're showing some signs of belligerence, but it's really kind of a holding pattern. And the, and she's trying to push our country in, in an opposite direction uh, from where we seem to be going. Because again, we see a lot of military buildup during the 1890s, the, the Navy's being built up. She sees this as alarming. She does respond very forcefully against the Spanish-American War and particularly against the occupation of the Philippines. So she's kind of in league with the anti-imperialists on this. And she actually testifies before Congress, along with Andrew Carnegie, uh, against the evils of war. And Carnegie's argument on that particular day was, well, if you have standing armies, you're going to use them. And if you have weapons, 
you're going to use them. So you guarantee, the way to guarantee future war is to have big standing armies and lots of big weapons. It's not a deterrent. Ultimately, it's an excuse to get into more warfare, which is a fair argument. So again, she's working very, very hard, traveling extensively, uh, meeting with her peace officers. And then another group that came along a little later, the American Women's Republic, the AWR. We see her in the middle, standing proudly uh, as the uh, acting attorney general for the Americans, American Women's Republic. Uh, this is not a, a, this is a group. This isn't a, they're not declaring like, you know, a takeover of a location or anything. But we see Mabel Lewis, the president, and Chaplain Reverend Susanna Harris uh, flanking her. And this was Belva at her finest. Uh, leadership groups, um, again, advocating um, peaceful solutions. And uh, again, women's rights, always at the forefront. Um, sadly, uh, during this period in the 1890s, she lost her daughter, Laura, to an illness, and again, it's 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 not coincidental. Her business started to flounder a bit after this. Her law profession, uh, losing a key member of the of the staff um, and her family, of course, was a was a big blow. Um, so, we see her persevering, and and we see her still fighting for women's suffrage, which she's been doing since she arrives in in, in, in D.C. in 1866. And as we get near near the end. Um, we see uh, an increasing agitation towards the suffrage movement. This is a 1909 cartoon opposing women's suffrage. We see the, the man about to have, he's going to have to change some diapers pretty soon, it looks like, and mom's going out to vote. So this was put out to remind men, don't, don't let women uh, this right. This is going to turn you into diaper changers. Um, so we see uh, an increasing uh kind of a, a backlash against the the increasing suffrage movement but again uh, belva's now into her 70s pushing 80s and no real changes are being made in fact some earlier advances have been have been rolled back um for example in utah the the women's right to vote was revoked before they became a state in 1890 uh, Wyoming continued to allow women to vote. So again, you know, the struggle, which in the 1870s, you had Wyoming, Utah, and Washington territory a little later allowing women to vote, but there's no advances. There's no other states coming on board. So it seems to be going, it's stagnant or even going backwards. So this is why in 1913, the women's uh, activists decide to really put a show on for the new president, Woodrow Wilson. And they're gonna have a big demonstration right down Pennsylvania Avenue, blocking the White House. Uh, and this is the program we see uh, for that event, which Belva was a part of, did give a speech. Again, she's um, 82 at this point and, and is just a tireless lion of, 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 of energy. Um, again, pushing for her one one wish, and that's a national a national right to vote for women. Unfortunately, she doesn't quite make it. She passes away in 1917. So this is at the the eve of our uh, introduction into the First World War. So so Belva saw the writing on the wall. She saw the buildup towards war. She originally had hope for Woodrow Wilson, and then started losing hope as the war the war drums started started beating louder again she bought into his 1916 uh campaign speech he kept us out of war which turns out to be just a technicality because he was getting us into war while he was using the speech he kept us out of war uh but again belva just had hope and she was really hopeful that the wilson administration in the second term would would make a difference and it turns out she she dies two years before the suffrage bill is passed and, uh, and again, it was not easy, you know, despite all of the fighting and all of the work they, you know, there were women standing in front of the White House for years, basically trying to get Wilson to change his mind on this one. He ends up, ends up being very stubborn on the issue. And uh, basically the bill was signed with, not with his approval. I, 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 it's just hard to imagine what, what, what they were up against. Uh, for all these years. But we see on the left uh, a depiction that's a Belva impersonator, perhaps, um, doing some speeches there at the gravesite. And there is the gravesite in Washington, D.C. Uh, Belva was 
was uh, buried in, in there in, in 1917. And now we're going to talk about the legacy of Belva. Um, there's a great quote of hers, uh, the glory of each generation is to make its own precedence, and she certainly qualifies on that count. And then we see the post office uh, decided to issue a Belva stamp in 1986. Uh, the, the USA 17 cent stamp there was just a, a small token of, of honoring a, uh, a forgotten legend in the, in the women's suffrage movement. Uh, during the research on this project, um, I came across a very fun little fact here, and this is the this is the Belva Lockwood uh, uh, um, Inn. Um, when I was researching her purchase of the building in, in Owego, New York, in 1863, I came across a very very fun little kind of timeline here on what happened to the house. So after she sold the house in 1865, the owners whether it's sold or not a couple of times, I'm not sure, but <clears throat> they eventually tore the house down and had it rebuilt across town in, in another part of Oigo. So again, it kind of languishes in obscurity until new owners bought it, I believe in the, I believe after 2000 and realized the history of the house and decided to put some research and effort and restoration into it. And in 2019, they opened the Belva Lockwood Inn. Indeed, the same building only relocated that Belva had bought and sold in 1863, sold in 1865, and allowed her to get to DC to have the career she had. So it is just a wonderful little honoring of Belva Lockwood here in Owego. And going into the, the, the website of the inn, just a very tasteful job of, of restoring uh, some period uh, furniture and some photographs and, and, and some history of Belva, truly an honoring of Belva. This isn't simply a place that gave her, gave the name and, and that's it. This is, this is beyond the name. You're, you're going to be infused in Belva if you stay there. And I would, I would love to visit. Uh, I think it's just a great idea, uh, historically uh, relevant B&Bs. And, um, and this one really, I hope, uh, I hope it's as, as lovely as it looks because it sure seems to be. So again, um, honoring Belva, uh, someone who, again, we, uh, we lost, it seems a while ago, and there's nothing saying that we can't restore her back to her place in history, a true forerunner, a true pioneer. It took, it took just the, the fortitude and the indomitableness and the, the just never give up spirit to get where she got to, to, to place her in, 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 a, in, a, in a true state of historical um, uh, appreciation. The sad, the, there was a sad ending towards the end of her career though. Um, she was involved in a very long standing case with the Cherokee tribe. And uh, it was a 30 year case began in the 1870s and it was settled in 1905. Um, and she was occasionally a part of the case and then was dropped and picked up again. So her connection wasn't consistent, but she was connected to one person in the case by the name of James Taylor, uh, who was an Eastern Cherokee trying to get uh, tribal uh, recognition and settlement money for his, his part of the tribe. When the Supreme Court unanimously agreed in 1905 to pay the Cherokee five million dollars it was like 1.7 plus court costs plus penalties whatever and ended up being close to five million dollars this was considered the pinnacle of her of her life this was the, the case she finally won after all these years she got along wonderfully with this james taylor person unfortunately though right before and taylor was again they were both very old at the time of the settlement um Taylor was 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 uh, near death when the settlement came through and ended up dying and supposedly before his death changed his will and and allowed his his uh, inheritors his 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 uh, his offspring to go after Belva for full attorney fees, which locked up her fees in court for a long, long time. And she ended up really not getting paid for the case. So it's a sad story of finally winning a case against the government only to have the people that you went into the case with go after you. So again, it's, it's kind of a sad legacy as far as her last law case goes. But overall, uh, I think 
her legacy stands up to the test of time simply just for what she had to put up with and uh and the the never ending um struggle that uh, we still hear about today equal pay i mean yes we have voting rights for all almost all but um the equal pay story no change you know the struggle continues so again it's a real eye opening uh, history story to to give you kind of an idea of the origins of of um, certain struggles and the fact that they never really end they just kind of go in go in circles. Thanks for listening and if there's any questions I'll be happy to uh, to try to answer. Wow, an outstanding presentation! Thank you so much. Very very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck, what was the um, the author's name of the biography? Jill Norgren. She's a she's yep. a lawyer. Yep. She's so, a lawyer. yeah. Yeah, if you are interested, um, if anybody out there is interested, you can actually um, you can listen to if you're want if you want to, you know, dive a little deeper. I believe that there's a video um, of you can probably let me just see if it's on YouTube. There, I know there's a video of, um, I believe it's the author. Um, is it the woman who would be president? Is that the name of the book? Yep, that's it. Yeah. That's the subtitle. So, yeah. so if you go to it's the WilsonCenter.org, you can just put actually put in Belva Lockwood. Um, you can watch a video of, of a lecture done by uh, I believe that particular author. Um, the woman who would be president, um, it's the Jill Norgren, she's the professor emerita City of University of New York, and you can watch her do a lecture um, about her writing this book. So it's available Good. online. So if anybody is interested and they want to dive into that. I haven't, I haven't seen it, but I would highly recommend it simply because of the length of time that uh, Jill Norgren spent on this book because of the difficulty in gathering all of the uh, the details and information. Again, there's no like Belleville Lockwood Center with all of her papers. Right. Uh, a lot of it was called from letters she wrote, uh, public sources, a lot of newspaper articles. So it was a very painstaking research project for Jill Norgren, I am sure. And the foreword of the book is uh, written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And it's a very nice, very brief, but very nice forward, again, acknowledging the door opening that the, the Belleville Lockwoods created for, for everyone who came afterwards. And I believe the book is out of print, too. So it's not, it's not easy to get. I mean, maybe libraries probably have a copy, but it's well, not an easy book to get. Talk about a book that should not be out of print. <laughs> it's this, this book. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This book should be required reading instead of being out of print. Yes. Yeah, and the interesting story behind the obscene, um, the obscene letters. As soon as you said um, she got jailed, she and her sister both were jailed for for uh, sending obscene things through the mail. What the obscene thing she was mailing was the expose on Beecher. Uh, the, yeah. the, the the minister uh, his affair he had an extramarital affair and she detailed right. <laughs> like there were details about the affair and that was what was deemed um yeah. you know obscene and that's why she went up in jail right she was that's, the, that's she was the original free love um, yes but but again but right but again, free love isn't like it does. It didn't mean then what it meant in, in the Woodstock generation. It, it meant basically freedom of choice of my body. You know, yeah. I want to have kids when I want to have kids. And, and you know, that that's really what the freedom she was talking about. It, it does get kind of lumped together a little weirdly. But um, again, you know, Woodhull brings this up. Uh, you know, and again, it comes up again with Belva when she's talking about the Mormons. I mean, she's she's talking about their generally upstanding character. They don't go to taverns. They don't go to, you know, they don't smoke. They don't, you know, they they're 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 generally you know upstanding citizens in that respect. And yet, this polygamy thing is driving everyone crazy. It's like, look at these people against polygamy. They're adulterers, philanderers. They they're doing back back alley abortions on their girlfriends, but they're against polygamy. Oh, oh, that's, yeah, that's really bad, you know? So again, and she was sarcastic. Her arguments were sound, you know, again, 
what a perspective. I mean, you could read it today and be astounded, but reading it from the perspective of the 1870s and 80s, wow. It's cool to see the process that, that Norgren does such a good job of, the process of her winning people over with logic, and men especially. There's like, there's like men falling into line during the whole story about finally like, and a lot of them were predisposed to, to agree based on their upbringing or whatever, but, but you can see some are like, wow, that really makes sense. I have to go along with that. You know, they're changing their views. They're changing their votes basically because she's such a strong arguer of her case. And again, this is how she was as a lawyer. She was not dramatic. She was very matter of fact, she tried to hit you on the toughest points that you couldn't fight back on. I mean, what, what else is a lawyer, a good lawyer going to do? So she was very effective and to see obscure male politicians and lawyers basically tank their careers for supporting her. There's one guy, a senator from Tennessee, I'm sorry, a congressman. I can't, I can't remember his name, Ansel or something like that. He, he was a short-term representative who boldly backs up an equal rights bill, uh, an equal pay bill very early on in, in, in uh, Belva's career in DC. She's basically not even a lawyer yet. She's an activist. She's a lobbyist trying to change legislation. And Arnell is the guy's name, Samuel Arnell. He's, he just stands up and it's in the congressional record. He's just, he's, he's listing man's wrongs towards women. And just to do that at the sake of your career at that time, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, he, he went away and we never heard about him again because, you know, probably because of that speech. Didn't fly over in the home district, apparently. Wow. Did, because again, I was just going to ask if anybody, uh, Marilyn, do you have a comment or a question? You're, I see you. I don't know if you're shake, raising your hand or. No, I, that was, you know, <laughs> things pop up on my screen, oh, okay. but no, this was, this is fascinating. Uh, you know, all these women that you never heard of, <laughs> you know, the time has come. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you. You bet. <laughs> Took long enough. <laughs> <laughs> And it seems like you could have you could have done, you know, uh, you could have done a, an hour on each of them in a way. Oh, I mean, absolutely. So, Marietta so Bo, much there. Oh, oh, Gage. Oh, man. Matilda Gage is just fascinating. I mean, again, when you see the breakup of the coalition, okay, you have the women's suffrage movement coalition. It starts to break up over things like religion and racism. For example, the racism I brought up by some of the West Coast uh, uh, activists, the, the, the gay, I'm sorry, the um, uh, Marietta Stowe. Marietta Stowe was an extremely cool, open-minded person until you started talking about the Chinese. Then she's gonna go off about how evil they are, they have to go back. So, so to find comp, true 100% common ground, is not possible. So they look for the common ground that they do have on the certain causes, but then you see these divisions start to overtake the common ground. Mm -hmm. The other division was over religion. You had a woman at this time, pretty much in charge of the temperance movement in this country. Her name was Frances Willard. And she was a, a very, very loud, charismatic, anti-alcohol to the T person, a very, very, very uh, like a righteous kind of a spirit. And this person angered women like, uh, like Matilda Gage to no end because Willard wanted to incorporate religion into the government. She wanted to have a religious test for government officials. She wanted to incorporate the word Christ into the constitution, which totally alarmed a free thinker like Matilda Gage and said, no, 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 no. The church has been a big problem for women over the years. We don't want more church. We want freedom to choose your religion, but we want less of that formality in the mix. So again, these clashes are a big part of the story. You know, it's possible if there was more cohesiveness, I'm not saying this for sure because society may not have been ready, but it's possible with more cohesiveness, especially when you start with your Anthony Stanton coalition. They're like the leadership of everyone at this time because they're 20 years older or more than everyone else. And to, to have them at the leadership positions and to have a, a coalesced group underneath them may have been may have been a different result. You may have had an earlier push for the uh, national suffrage movement and it may have actually come to fruition earlier. But that's just a possibility because you had so many men in control 
like that judge in Maryland who basically is not only denies Belva the right to practice law in Maryland, says, I hope I never see the day when women can argue in front of me. Gee, that's, if, if the guy is like 50 years old, that's like 30, 40 more years. I don't want to see this. Like that's, that's ridiculous. And again, I know Jill Nordman put in these extreme examples of the reactions for effect. And, and, and again, it was well done. She, 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 dug out a lot of really um, obscure responses to the, the rejections that, that Belva had to face. And it really shows you what they were up against. Oh, man, unbelievable. Just just a, a wall of idiots, basically. <laughs> yeah. um, we still I, have it. You know, we still Stowe, have it. Uh, <laughs> the, do you know what the genesis of Stowe's hatred towards uh, Asians was? I'm curious, because she... She seemed to be, in all other respects, a very forward-thinking individual. Why did she have that particular, you know? I think it was very, very common amongst the wealthy of California. I think it's a California thing, and I, it's a wealthy thing. I, they, for some reason, you know, you had basically a, a welcoming to a degree of, of the Chinese laborers in, in California mm -hmm. in, the, in the late 1860s. The, 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 this is the, the railroad building era. And as the railroad building era fades, and the 1880s uh, uh, move along, we see uh, more, more Chinese laborers without work, uh, and we see more competition for the work that is there with the white laborers. So I think the animosity grew from the 1860s to the 1880s for the fact that maybe some of these rich people thought the Chinese were gonna just help out and then go back home and not stay. And many did, but many did stay as well and created a, you know, a, a more of a, an, an increasing problem. Again, it's very much a California thing or a West Coast thing. I don't see that same kind of racism with the East Coast and the and the and the Mid America uh, uh, activists. What's also interesting too on on the subject of race is that African Americans are a big part of the story, including female African Americans. They're a big part of the story early on in D.C. post Civil War, eighteen sixties. 1870s. And then gradually, as this argument comes up between are we supposed to be protecting all citizens' rights, which would be universal suffrage? Are we, are we going to divide and just make sure these Black men get their voting rights, which was the, you know, the amendments, the 13th, 14th, 15th, they were in, in that category? Or, you know, you got to realize so many women were totally disappointed at those amendments because they left them out. They, they only focused on Black men. And they were they were working on things together. Frederick Douglass was a big part of this, but you saw Frederick go his way when the primary the primariness of, of black male vote took over from general voting or women's voting. So again, the, the, the subdivisions are great, but I think the racism is not confined to the West Coast, but especially the anti-Asian racism is very much a West Coast California thing. What was that? What was the perspective of the, um, of, of, of I guess the great black male thinkers of that period of time? I would think that they would have been overwhelmingly in favor of women's suffrage in terms of realizing what they had suffered themselves not being able to vote. But were they, or did they make the split at sex as well and say no, we're joining with our uh, our white brethren, so to speak, and not wanting women to vote? You know, it's it's hard to pinpoint that it's not really covered in in this particular book. I, I I'm 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 assuming there are some scholarly approaches on this topic, uh, which would be interesting to look at because that that's a fair question. Uh, but again, I, using the example of Frederick Douglass, which is the easiest because he was probably the most prominent African American through this period consistently in in many different aspects of life. His, his, if you're going to take his lead on maybe a trend of what had happened, then it's, per, it's possible that he, they followed his lead and, and kind of became more focused on the needs for these free black men, as opposed to w white women of the North, who I, I guess they thought wasn't really a primary topic of concern. You know, it was more of a post-Civil War urgency, which led to these amendments, which again led to this split in this in this in this women's suffrage debate, because there were people who thought that those amendments included women, even though women it wasn't it wasn't specifically enumerated in the in the in the amendment. The, the word woman wasn't used, but 
there was a movement at this time, and in fact, it was codified in some areas, that all uses of the word male from here forward will be considered human beings or persons, oh. not just men. So, so judges before this point were very much particular. Oh, it says male. Sorry, you're out. Sorry, it says male. And also, the other things that really blocked a lot of professional women's uh, uh, advances was was the fact that there was a an old English law known as the law of coverture, and it goes into the uh, effect that once a woman is married, she becomes the husband, basically. She becomes the man. All of her stuff is the man. She has no legal right to enter into any contracts or any businesses because it's the man that now takes over, you know, for that person. So they're, they're, it's like one person. You're covered. Coverture means covered. The man covers the woman. So this was interesting in Belva's case because as a married woman, originally she was restricted. Then she was widowed the first time. She had freedom of business that she didn't have while she was married. So that's why she was able to buy and sell a school in the 1860s. But once she got married to Ezekiel in 1869, she no longer could have done those things as easily. Although by the 1870s, these laws were being eroded basically by what I just mentioned, things like re reviewing the use of the term male and basically saying that this now means persons, not just male. Male, male was thrown in originally just because women weren't in that field. It wasn't necessarily to keep women out. When women started challenging that, then they had to change the wording officially so they couldn't use that as an excuse anymore. Oh, male only. No, 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 it's persons now. So that allowed women to basically enter any field they wanted to. However, it did not offer any federal protection. The, the governments and the, and the courts consistently refused federal attempts at protecting voters' rights, whether it was women. I mean, the only federal protection of the Black voting right in the South was the Enforcement Act, or the I think it's called the Enforcement Act, which basically puts the police power behind the 14th and 15th amendments. It puts, it puts teeth, meaning that states will have to answer to the feds if they don't honor voting rights. And so that, that, that's, that's not, at this time in history, that's not normal. The states had mo most of the control. So to have even a request for a federal intervention, whether it's protecting voting rights or whatever, was very unusual and didn't, didn't often happen. One of the first cases of a federal protection offered to women happens with Belva's help in the 1860s after she first gets there. And it's the RNL bill I mentioned. It was a very obscure bill that was written to increase women's pay in the Treasury Department. It was extremely narrow in its scope, yet it was supposed to be, according to RNL and Belva, it was supposed to be a, a wedge or a, a starting point or a a, 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 you know, a, a bell, a, a, you know, a kind of a, 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 a way to get something started on a federal level, even though it wouldn't protect women outside the treasury, it, it was passed. And they were looking at this like a very, very small stepping stone, which it kind of was, but it just was a very, very small stepping stone because, you know, 50 years later, they were still treading the same water. Um, Chuck, I'm so sorry. We do have to stop. We have another program that's starting, but um, as you can hear, uh, you know, there's there's no there's no end um, to Chuck's knowledge. We are going to have Chuck back in um, uh, April. We're we're doing Teddy Roosevelt, right? Yeah, we are. Ten things you didn't know about Teddy Roosevelt. I heard you say that to Tom. I think Teddy. I think I'm going to have to do something limited like that. Okay. I can't really do the full scope but, of but Ted. Anything, any, it's it's going to be fun. It's going to be um, informative, entertaining, and um, we welcome uh, you back, Chuck, anytime. Uh, I wish you you just have your own channel and you could just tune in anytime <laughs> to be talking about something. Uh, but this is great. Thank you so much. And um, if you are in within, um, I know you can't make it, but we do have a, a women's history um, finale to Women's History Month. It's a free concert at the First Lutheran Church in Montclair, four o'clock on this coming Friday. It's on Park Street next to the high school. There's parking in the back, four o'clock concert, sort of a happy hour concert. Uh, but it's uh, women composers, and it's it's uh, with the musicians from for, um, from the Montclair um, early music uh, troupe. 
So please join us for that. Chuck, thank you once again. This is this program, if you missed it, if you missed the beginning, well, it was recorded. So we are going to show it on our YouTube channel and our, cal our hard copy calendars should be out tomorrow. So thanks again, Chuck. And thank you to our audience and to uh, everybody for being here. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks to thank everyone. You. Thanks, for, thank thanks for showing up. Bye. Appreciate it. Okay.